Good afternoon, councillors. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of the Applied Council Police and Fire Scrutiny Committee. Uh, before we start, I would just like to, to welcome Joe Cooper to the meeting. Joe has uh, will be soon promoted and will be taking over at the Port Glasgow uh, Fire Station as the station commander. Uh, so, welcome to the meeting, Joe, and uh, congratulations on your promotion. We start off with a holiday consultation, please. With apologies from Councillor Murphy and Councillor Johnson. Can you now move to a roll call? Can following members please indicate if they're present at the meeting in person or remotely? Councillor Cloperty? Uh, remotely. Councillor Crowther? Present remotely. Councillor Jackson? Uh, remotely. Councillor McLeod? Remotely. Councillor McAlaney? Present remotely. Councillor McVeigh. Present the Chamber. Councillor Moran. Remotely. Councillor Nelson. In Chamber. Councillor Quinn. Remotely. Are there any declarations of interest? Okay, we will move to agenda item number two, which is Scottish Fire and Rescue Services Performance Report. Uh, David, can you summary, please? Thanks, convener. I'll bring um, Murdo in in a second to run through um, what is largely a, a positive report for, for the for the committee. Just a, a couple of things, if 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 you'll allow me. Uh, you mentioned uh, Joanne Cooper, who's on the call. Joanne will take over uh, um, on a temporary basis. Um, Greenock and Port Glasgow station. Delighted to welcome Joe as part of the team. Uh, committee members will see that non-domestic element to the to the report, um, which is later on in the report. Joe's one of our protection officers currently, so she's bringing a wealth of experience from a prevention and protection background. So really pleased to be able to welcome Joe into the team. She knows Inverclyde well. Uh, she was based down there for a significant part of our, our time within the team. Um, bonfire night. Um, really pleased to see a much reduced in terms of our activity this year. We have seen probably in the media acts of violence across Scotland against emergency personnel. I'm really pleased to announce that we had none in Inverclyde, which yes, we should expect, but it's also pleasing to see um, partnership working was really key on the night with our colleagues in police and the local authority in the run up to it, uh, and the deployment on the night was excellent. So thanks again, Inverclyde Council and our colleagues in Police Scotland. Um, COP26 has concluded um, a largely successful event from, from an activity perspective. The huge amount of planning went into it. Um, real credit to all the agencies that were involved, including our own planning team. Um, but, but being absolutely no doubt, in terms of the level, level of relative inactivity, we can't underplay not only the resources, but the way in which the event was policed. So I just wanted to place on record my thanks to Police Scotland, a, a, a hugely um, uh, intensive, resource intensive period for them in particular. I, I was in the coordination centre at Govan um, throughout the event and to see the way in which that operation ran was, was hugely slick. So I, I just convened there if you would allow me to place on record my thanks to Police Scotland. They were, they were excellent. And at that stage, I'll bring in Murdo to go through the report. Thanks, David. Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, can you Thanks, boss. Thanks, convener and elected members. I'll take you through the high-level summary of our report for this quarter. As David said, very pleasing to note that we have a generally downward trend in, in all our activity, if you look at the figures over uh, the year on year, and particularly the three-year average, which is very pleasing to see. Our incident summaries Again, continuing a very positive trend where we have some rise in our activity, for example, our fires primary and secondary. Um, that's very much a seasonal matter. And with the dry period that we had um, during this reporting period, my experience tells me that that is to be expected. Um, special services are increased. However, I would, I would expect that to continue to increase and say that that's a good thing because an awful lot of our special service activity now is assisting other partner agencies um, with um, harm that we can prevent. And I'm delighted to, to, to say that we are more and more involved with that now and will con we'll continue to be so. So I would say a rise in special service, although some of these are attributed to road traffic collision activity within 
the localities uh, is, is a positive thing because we're assisting other partner agencies. Very pleasing to see a significant reduction in our fire non-fire casualties as well. I'd like to draw your attention to our overall three-year average of incidents and highlight that 56% of our overall operation activity continues to be round about false alarms. And with our recent consultation on our unwanted fire alarm signals, I think this will herald an absolute sea change in the way we do our activity. Um, it was interesting, I was on a council meeting with the Health and Social Care Partnership and the fire alarm went off in the building that many of the colleagues were, were, were present within. And uh, they knew at the time of the meeting what the source of the alarm was, and yet we had three fire appliances moving along towards that incident and partner agencies supporting us and well, along with road risk and um, safety issues with regards to our own personnel and for the public, if we can look at dealing with these incidents in a very different way, that will free up a lot of capacity for us to, uh, to do an awful lot more good within our communities. And we'll continue to, re to report on that as the outcome of the consultation is ongoing. Moving on in, in terms of domestic safety, again, very pleased to see a generally downward trend. And once again, that is primarily down to the good education that we do along with our partners, good information sharing protocols in the local authority and uh, smoke detection. And we'll always herald that. Um, we have a period of transition before the new legislation comes in in February of 2022. And uh, we will um, continue to uh, be supportive with regards to that transition and um, a bit of a sea change with regards to how we deal with the public because for private occupiers and the landlords, it will be their responsibility to comply with this legislation. We will still make people's property safe in terms of fitting working smoke detectors. However, it's not the fire services uh, responsibility to fit to the, to the new standard for private dwellings. Moving on for us to look at uh, casualties from fire incidents. Very pleasing to say that there has been no fire related casualties during this reporting period. And once again, uh, that's down to the matters that I've raised before. Non fire related casualties, we've got eight recorded. Six of those are, are road traffic collision related, and we have tried and tested partnership approach to dealing with that. Once again, there are seasonal elements there. Uh, we'll continue to promote uh, road safety messaging, and six of those were in the Inverclyde South West area. De moving on to deliberate fire setting, we have an increase there. Once again, that's set against the reduction in our primary percentage, and there is a there is a seasonal element to our de uh, deliberate deliberate secondary fire setting, which uh, I mentioned earlier. And I wouldn't say that's to be expected. However, uh, the dry weather and the holiday season does play a part in that most years. Non-domestic fire safety, as, a, as David said during the introduction, uh, Joanne comes to us for the station commander for the Inverclyde, Port Glasgow, Greenock Fire Stations from our protection team with a wealth of experience. And there's a lot of unsung work goes on in the background to protect and educate our businesses and our duty holders. And uh, it's, it's impressive to see how supportive that work is. And if there is any fire related activity within uh, premises in our localities, um, we are very, very quick to post fire audit these premises and provide support and information. And we are necessary um, raise matters for improvement with these duty holders. Unwanted fire alarm signals, um, very much a consistent <coughs> pattern and has been for probably as long as the Fire and Rescue Service has been presenting to you. However, um, and can I conclude in the overall subject matter of the report? Um, I would like to very much uh, support the consultation that has come out for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and circulated to all partners with regards to a sea change in how we approach these 
and um, putting more onus on the duty holders with regards to their responsibilities and having a staged approach to uh, our, our response. And that will free up a lot of capacity for us to do other good work within our communities. That concludes the summary of a high-level report. So we will take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very, very much, Myrtle. I'm going to come to the, the phones first. I'll come to Councillor Jackson. Paul, any, any questions? Colin, any ears? Okay, we'll, we'll move to Councillor McLeod. Hey, John, have you got a question for the fire service? Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, first of all, it's good news to see that uh, there's been a, a, a continuing downward trend uh, regarding fire incidents overall. Uh, and I've, I've no doubt that uh, uh, the prevention uh, is, is, is played a part in, the, in this. I know you have been, uh, fire service has been doing this for a good number of years now. Um, as, the, as the old uh, saying goes, that Prevention is always better than cure. Um, so well done in continuing um, your prevention um, amongst the residents. Um, good to hear as well that there's, uh, uh, there was very little incident on uh, or no incidents in, um, of, of real note on bonfire night. I just wondered though how many call outs you had on the night. It'd be if you could. If you could let us know that. Um, the the one spoiler I think uh, in all of this is uh, around deliberate fire setting. Uh, it's sad to see that this is still increasing. Um, it's, it's not good news. Um, now, seeing uh, there is a bit where it talks about highlighting the trend or increased activity areas, uh, you, you have the, the hubs to, to address, to, to look at. Uh, the specific areas. I wonder if you're able to let us know the, the sort of areas which are across, uh, causing uh, more of a problem for the fire service. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. David, for Muddle. Councillor, th thanks for that. The, the actual specific data around call numbers is collated by our operations control team and they're still in the process of doing that to give us exact figures for each local authority area. However, it's it's an overall downward trend and as I say, we had the added concurrent events of COP26 and business as usual, so it was pleasing to see that we had specific resources for COP26, but also it didn't affect our business as usual resource, so overall activity was down. I could probably get you specific numbers as and when that central team provide them to us. Um, in terms of deliberate fires, um, Alan Barnes attends those meetings uh, on on a three-week basis. I'm conscious that it's a, I'm conscious that it's a public forum, and rather than drawing attention to specific areas, again, if you, if you allow me, I can provide that detail to you off table through the council officers. Yes, that would be good. Thanks very much for both. No Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, I'll try again for Councillor Jackson. If not, we'll move on. Uh, sorry, no, we're not. Uh, Councillor Nelson's got a question. Councillor Nelson, you can Yeah, thanks for two questions. I, I noticed on page seven that the, the non fire casualties by war that ever played South West is, is the highest. Um, now, I, mean, I haven't seen previous statistics, so I don't know. I just wondered if, if there was any reason that, that, that this was just kind of random. That, uh, that it was so high in Aberdeen like South Southwest, and if it's if it does take a higher level of time, you know, is, is there a reason that's known why it's higher all the time? And the, the other question was on page uh, eight. It's talking about primary fire ratio by activity type um, and the deliberate fire setting, and it's got thirty eight percent for vehicles. And I was just wondering, is, is that just ones that are known to the deliberate vehicles fires? Because I'm not seeing any vehicle fires that just happen because um, of the light school calls, for example, you know, uh, causing fires, which is it's quite common, especially on the bottom of a vehicle where you get the light school and fuel uh, together. So those are my two questions. Councillor, in terms of the, 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 the non-fire casualties, those can be 
probably unnaturally skewed in the terms that if you have a road traffic collision within one area and you've maybe got three or four people within that vehicle, you know, and, and it could be very minor injuries, it could be shock, it could be a bruise, these sort of skew the figures. So whilst that looks like a high concentration, can actually just be a couple of instances that, that throws that casualty data out. Sorry, I, can you just repeat your second question? I wasn't, I'm not sure if I caught it all. The, the, the second question was in page eight, it's, it's showing on the, the right-hand side the primary fire ratio by activity type under the, the, I mean, I think the whole thing is deliberate fire setting. And it's saying that vehicles, you know, it says 38% there. Um, yeah. And I was just wondering, is that just vehicles that have been known to deliberately set on fire? Or is that vehicles as well who, who have uh, had, for example, an electrical problem or a... A fuel being on a cat or something that's that's worse than the flames. Is is there any definition between them? Yes, so that the, the, the deliberate fire setting element will mean that the instant commander who attended first will have made a, an, an assumption or, or done an investigation rather to find out what the cause of that was. So that would be a deliberate fire. So essentially that's 38% of the 8%, if that makes sense. So it's less than 10% and a third of that again. So over the quarter, uh, three vehicle fires would roughly, you know, do my... My, my not so great arithmetic, it would be around that number. So it's, it's 38% of the 8%. So you take that figure of 96, we take you around about the three. But yes, it's vehicles that the instant commander has deemed have been set on fire deliberately. Right. So if, if a vehicle had gone on fire and wasn't set on fire deliberately, where would that appear then? That would, that would still sit within the primary fire statistics, but not under deliberate fire setting. Right. Okay. Thank you. David, if I could just come in as well, just for some clarity on the um, non-fire casualty stats. Of, there is there is no patterns there um, for those um, casualties involved in RTCs. Several different roadways. The good thing about it is it's all minor injuries with people transported to Edinburgh by hospital for uh, precautionary checkups. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, okay, Councillor Jackson, calling you there. Yeah, I'm confined, Tommy, no questions. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, members, 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 the report's pretty positive, Paul, we'll get into some detail in terms of the local area command, uh, but again, it's still following the new format, which was agreed by, by members. So the front page gives a kind of comparison against the five-year average, but we'll also give you a bit of a flavour as to how we're performing against uh, this year, uh, and the highlights are all included in the executive summary. But I'll just hand over to Paul. Paul, do you want to give us a flavour, please? Yeah, um, okay, so I've got quite a bit to get through, as usual, I'll try and get through as quick as I can. Uh, so total crime, uh, that continues to fall, uh, so this year we are down 4.9%, uh, and when we look at the five-year average, it's, we're down 14.2%. Uh, total number of incidents uh, reported is down 13.1% on the five-year average, and 10.2% uh, based on the same period as, as this time last year. Uh, common assaults, uh, we have 33 fewer assaults compared to the five-year average, and this is a 11.6% reduction, um, so it's 33 less victims, basically. Uh, uh, we have had 70 assaults on emergency workers that have been recorded. Uh, unfortunately, this is an increase of, of six based on the five-year average. Um, uh, dishonesty, so there's a bit of dishonesty here. So dishonesty uh, crimes uh, continue to fall. They're down by 16.9%. House break-ins also continue to fall from a five-year average of 79 house break-ins to a recorded 50 house break-ins this year. That's down 37.2%. Uh, and we've also increased our uh, detection rate on house break-ins by a further 8.2%, currently sitting at 28.2%. Uh, cyber crime that continues to rise 
Unfortunately, that's up 37.3% on the five-year average, which equates to an additional 77 crimes. Uh, we've had lots of different various scams out there using telephone techniques, text messages, emails, fake web websites, criminal seeking passwords. Uh, we did so some stuff with Inverclyde Council earlier this year when we sent out the Take 5 fraud information leaflets, which were all sent out in the council tax bills. Uh, and we continue to use uh, social media to try and educate the public around about some of these uh, latest scams that are ongoing uh, so that we can give people a chance. Uh, 169 shoplifting offences, that's down 2.1% on the five-year average. And, and motor vehicle crime has also fallen 26.8% uh, on the five-year average, and that's equates to 46 less crimes. Uh, domestic abuse, so we've had... Uh, for this report period, we've had 318 domestic abuse incidents recorded. That's down 16.5% when measured against the five-year average. I can I can give you a bit of reassurance soon about that, that that performance is absolutely in line with what the national trend is across Scotland. So so we're not we're not any different from anywhere across Scotland with that. Our detection rate for domestic abuse uh, has increased by 22.9%. On the five-year average, we're currently sitting at a, de a, a detection rate of 80.8%. Uh, violent crime, that's down 16.1% on the five-year average. And, and year-to-date, we've had 43 crimes uh, as opposed to 57. So it's 14 less uh, crimes of violence that's been recorded. And then for Clyde, robberies are down 46.8%. Serious assaults are down 38.5%. percent i am nearly there, I'm nearly finished. Uh, road traffic, so the number of uh, casualties, uh, I'm pleased to say, has dropped. Uh, this time last year we had 14, this, this, year, this time in this period we've had 11, so that's a reduction of 35.7%. However, we have uh, had a significant increase in the number of people being charged with drink, and in particular, drug driving. Uh, so we've had 61 cases in this reporting period. That represents uh, an increase of 56.5% on the previous five-year average. Um, I have received uh, outstanding support from the road pollution department, uh, and that's the reason why the numbers are so high, because uh, I have expressed a real concern. You've probably seen it in the newspapers, but I have expressed a concern, and I put it to the public to tell us if you know anyone suspected of drink driving or drug driving to let us know and I, I, I'm pleased to say that the reports we're getting by via Crime Stoppers has led to many of these arrests so that, that tactic seems to be working for us. Uh, disorder, so disorder complaints are down 26.6% over the same period last year. Vandalisms are decreased from a five year average of 253 vandalisms to 197 in this reporting period. So that's down. Uh, and as you know, we have a dedicated action plan that we still continue every weekend on the youth disorder. And we are still making really good use of the parent alert letters, which we've got in partnership with uh, the council. Uh, and that's to give out the parents that early warning about their children being uh, associated or in the company of others committing crime. Uh, missing people. So we've had 141 missing people uh, recorded uh, in Inverclyde. That's a reduction of 39 0.2%, a big bit of that is because of the new processes we put in place for the not-at-home system. That's working really well, uh, really well, actually, for us in Inverclyde. Uh, and over two-thirds of the missing people, I'm, I'm pleased to say, are traced within 24 hours. Uh, and then I suppose that kind of covers the performance. Just a couple of local highlights for me, as always, I in at the end of this. So the bonfire night, uh, like my colleague in the fire service, I would really like to thank Inverclyde Council and the Fire Service. Uh, it was outstanding partnership work uh, on the night leading up to it as well. Uh, they made sure that everything went really, really smoothly. It could not have went any more smoother than it did on the night. Uh, no no incidents, no assaults, no injuries. You know, compare that to last year, it's really great. Um, so that, 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 was a, that was a great success as far as I'm concerned. Uh, DBI, we continue to work with DBI. That's the Distress Brief Interventions. You probably heard me get really excited about that uh, two meetings ago. Um, so we're still making really good progress with that. So 31 individuals have been referred via DBI. 
and that has been an absolute huge success for us down here. Operational officers love it, I love it, and the partners love it, so it's here to stay, hopefully. Uh, Inverclyde Partnership Hub, so there's been a bit of progress made on that. I said I would come back to this meeting and give you the update on that. So we spoke about uh, creating a one-stop shop, um, so that that is that is really well there almost. Uh, I now have an email address for elected members. Uh, that, I'll get that email address out to you, but it is it's it's community partnership at inverclyde.gov.uk. Uh, that's going to be so. If you as an elected member have whatever whatever you want to raise with any of the partners, um, previously you'd have to raise it with multiple partners to get your response. Now you'll go to one one email address, create a partnership. The partnership hub will then discuss it. We'll then get the answer and get it back to you in a single layer. Uh, that's the plan. Um, that's a massive step forward for Inverclyde. Um, and other than that, I'm going to stop because I could talk all day about the stuff that's going on, but I'm happy to any questions. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Paul. Uh, before I come to questions, uh, Ruth, uh, you just like to add a wee bit on the partnership hub. Yeah, just to come in on the on the Progressive Partnership Hub, just to say we have we've had um, a succession of, of very successful meetings. Just to say with the one stop shop, just if if you would like to give us a little bit of time with that, because we want to come up with a protocol um, and how how that can be used, and uh, just uh, just a, a sort of uh, a flowchart of what would happen. So just to say that um, that whilst the whilst the email address has been set up, there's a little bit of work yet to do before it actually goes live, is my understanding. Okay, hey, thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, uh, the first one I want uh, to ask, uh, I've got two questions, Tommy. The first one, I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, common assault is down, but um, I, I do understand that, you know, I, I'm going to give two scenarios here, and I, and I hope you just bear with me here. Um, I, know, I know of two scenarios where uh, assaults have taken place. Um, one elderly gentleman, uh, was assaulted by a neighbour. Uh, another young lady was assaulted uh, by two people. She, you know, she was basically jumped, using using a loud term. The, the, the way this is settled by the police is um, each individual uh, is given a fixed penalty notice. Um, in the case of the, the lady, two people jumped her. It was a case of her being word against theirs. Same with the, the elderly gentleman who was attacked, 60-year-old gentleman attacked by a 20-year-old. Uh, and both victims. Um, um, through you, through apologies, through you, convener, uh, Councillor Jackson. Uh, apologies. I think you need to be very careful. I, I thought you were describing generic scenarios, and uh, you, you'll be aware you cannot talk about specific uh, cases. Uh, I okay. wonder if you could perhaps reframe your your question, or, or right. perhaps the police would be able to answer your. Uh, okay. your I, 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 an incident where um, say a young say an individual was jumped and attacked by two people, then it is a case of their word against the person who attacked them. Uh, and it's very common now for both people to involved uh, to get a fixed penalty notice. So these attacks, these victims don't appear on the, the, the numbers which have just been described. Uh, so it's nice, it's good to hear that common assault is down, but it's, these numbers don't reflect the amount of people who are uh, attacked. But because there's no witnesses, it's their word against the other, uh, that they themselves, the victim, are issued with a fixed penalty notice. It doesn't it doesn't really install uh, much confidence in a victim, uh, someone who's been attacked, that they themselves have to accept a fixed penalty notice or it goes to, to court. Now, I'm led to believe that this is done uh, to cut down in bureaucracy. Um, I just, I'm just wondering if these numbers are reflected or if maybe a comment could be made on that. Now, I have a second question. Can I can I go ahead with that one? No, Paul, take, take the first one first, Paul. It's quite important. Yeah, okay, thank, thanks, take Tommy. Take the first one to come back to you. Uh, and, and it's not a criticism. I realise it's one word against the other. Uh, I just want to get that in, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so what I would say is... is we, we only issue a fixed penalty ticket when the threshold is met for any crime that's been committed. So it's not the, 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 the general rule is that 
uh, you've got corroboration of some sort that will, that will say something's happened. So, um, uh, fixed penalty notice is a, is a lower end, and it's and actually it's through the criminal justice system to speed up criminal justice outcomes for individuals. But the the actual evidence, the proof of evidence, is exact same as it would be in any other assault allegation. If we issue a fixed penalty ticket, we won't issue it because one person says it and somebody else says it. There has to be corroboration of some sort that basically says that this did harm. Um, so you wouldn't get a fixed pe penalty ticket if one person, if you only had one element of, of corroboration, you had no element of corroboration, um, so you, you would only get that fixed penalty ticket if it's met the threshold of, of what the common law of crime is. And that's, you know, it, um, that doesn't matter whether it goes on a crime report or whether it's a fixed penalty ticket. You will only get that ticket if it's met the threshold that the crime has been committed and can be proven. Um, so you'll never get a ticket because it's the easier option and there's less evidence. It's got to be the exact same amount of evidence as it would be for any crime report. Could you possibly provide numbers of uh, amount of fixed penalties that have been issued uh, within this kind of regard? Uh, I could get that. I don't have it with me today, but I can certainly get that. I'll take an action and I'll get that for you. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Tommy, can I possibly ask my second question? Yeah, I'm trying to mind, be mindful of what Anne said there. Uh, it, it's on uh, loan sharks. Uh, I've been made aware that there has been a, a, a rise in loan sharks operating uh, in, in my own ward. Uh, Greenock uh, Central in East End. Um, now, you know, with, with thinking, without going into the politis, politics of it, there's been cuts in universal credit. Uh, the cost of living's gone through the roof. Uh, today, I, I spoke to um, union officials who, let's say, uh, the members have indicated that they themselves have started going to uh, pay their lenders and, in some instances, uh, loan sharks. Um, one of them described a, a, a double figure sum, let's say fifty pound, which is now a debt of uh, four four figures, let's say four thousand uh, pound, and still no uh, sign of paying that off. Now I understand that the the very nature of this is it is very quiet. Nobody wants their business to be made public. Nobody's going to go to the police to report this. I understand there's an illegal money lending unit been set up uh, to, to help individuals uh, or inform them of other ways to, to borrow money legally. So it was just to see if, um, if the police would like to comment on that because given the poverty in Inverclyde, given uh, the, the low pay, uh, the uh, you know the, the the vulnerable work that people are in, low wages, you know uh, zero hours contracts, you know uh, the the cut in universal credit. Um, that looks as if there is a rise of these. So I, I need to mind my language describing these people, these uh, these individuals taking advantage of the poor <laughs> and the played. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Paul. Before I bring uh, Chief Inspector Callum back in, uh, 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 these issues that they do come up, and I think, well, as I like the member, we should always be trying to, to assist anybody in, in, in who we find in similar situations. And there is a base available through HSCP and, and other agencies within the council, so it's something we, we can all help with. Uh, but I'll, I'll bring Chief Inspector Callum back in again, please, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, so I have had a wee look at this. Um, so I know the councillor said that he's been made aware. Um, I, I suppose the plea for me would be that uh, out of this meeting, the councillor could maybe just uh, give me a call to tell me exactly what it is he's been made aware of, and, and I'll make sure that that's put into our intelligence system and any work that needs to be done around about that. I can 100% assure you that will be done. Uh, because uh, money laundering of any type is just absolutely appalling. and. If I get if I get wind of it, if I if I hear who's doing it, I will definitely deal with it. Um, what I will say is, is I don't have any active thing on that at the moment. So any any information I can get, which Mr. Jackson may have, that would be really useful for me, uh, and I can give this being an absolute assurance that we'll have a look at that and take any action to stop this from happening because it's it's appalling. Yeah, Mr. Cameron, I, I would I would like to to actually arrange to discuss that with you. 
as you, as you, as you probably appreciate, as I, as I said, you know, very few people are willing to come forward and discuss this uh, through a fear of intimidation, uh, a fear of, you know, repercussion. And it is uh, a very uh, underground, it's a very quiet kind of business that goes on, but it's certainly going on. Um, I have myself spoken, I raised this with council officers uh, last week, uh, and unfortunately, uh, council officers have uh, been very slow to respond. I know uh, West Lothian Council, they are actively uh, running a campaign to highlight, uh, as we come into Christmas, uh, to, to let people know that there's other ways, uh, that's, that there's other financial support out there, to an active campaign to stay away <laughs> from sharks and money lenders. Uh, so maybe it's one of these things we need to be proactive with. Uh, before anybody else gets into the hands of this, these people. Yep. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy to meet and discuss this at any time. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Thanks for that, Colin. Uh, uh, I appreciate your concern. I appreciate it. it's, uh, it's a subject very close to hand. We'll just need to watch my language and how, how, how we're talking about things. But your points are very, very well taken, and I, and I trust that yourself and uh, Chief Inspector Cameron will meet pretty soon uh, to, to see if we can what we can do on that. Uh, but thanks very much for your contribution. Uh, I'll move on to Councillor Jim McLean, followed by Councillor Blockerty. Thanks, Convener. Before I go into my original question, can I go back to, to Colin's uh, point about the fixed uh, penalties? The wee question that, that gets evolved from that is, by accepting a fixed penalty, is that an admittance of guilt? <laughs> if it's meeting the threshold, the threshold you said, uh, Paul? Uh, yeah, so you have to accept it. Yeah, so by accepting it, yeah, you're accepting the circumstances that are on that fixed penalty ticket. If you if you if you disagree, then you don't need to accept it. And yeah, so you, yeah. yeah. So, so in effect, is that the wording? Uh, try to think a generic example. The wording would be that this is such and such would be blah blah blah. Uh, the, the the evidence proves that that, that you were guilty of doing X, X, Y, and Z, then uh, you've been offered the opportunity to accept this fixed penalty. Yeah, yeah that thing. Much. Does that then go into the individual's record or, or what? Uh, it, it's held on record. I don't know how long it's held on record for, but I know, I know it's definitely held on record because you're, you're not allowed so many fixed penalty tickets over a, a set period of time. Okay, that's fine. Thanks for that. Going back to my original uh, question was regarding the, the community partnership hub. Uh, I take it we're, we're still in the, the process of setting that up, uh, thanks to Ruth there, the additional information. But I would like to think that once we are ready to go, uh, elected members will give a, a list of partners as to who is, is all partaking in this. The other question from that uh, would be, is, is this just a, a email address or a contact address for elected members, or will that be made widely available to the members of the public? So, uh, so that email address is just for elected members at this time, um, and it's it's to it's to create that one stop shop approach really. So, uh, the the scenario I use is you've got uh, two house two houses, neighbour dispute, children involved, schools involved. Do you right now you have to write to the housing, you have to write to the police, the council, and the education authority. So there's four letters for the one instance you've got. Now what we're saying is, well, actually, you could write that to the, the partnership hub. The partnership hub will then discuss that uh, three times a week, we sit on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then we'll, we'll agree right, who's taking that forward. We'll then compile, we'll then get that, you know, the response back to you. So you don't need to chase people up, but it's basically the partnership hub is there, and all those partners are around the table. Um, is it up and running? It's been up and running uh, since April uh, as a proof of concept. Um, so it has, it has been running. Um, the next phase of this is, is, is phase two, if you like, um, and that's where we're, we're looking at bringing in an analyst as well. So we will look at the analytical product of you know bringing all those partners together. What does that look like in Everclyde, and how can we get some preemptive work done uh, to to stop stuff happening in the first place? Um, so I, the partnership hub is actually you know. I can't. I don't have the exact numbers, but the last time I think I came here it was just over a thousand referrals that had been discussed, uh, and of that, so many went to fire service, so many to, went to housing and uh, social work, and 
um, and it really does speed up the whole decision making process and, and more importantly the ownership um, and it joins up the dots where we're all we're all working to the same goal uh, to keep the community safe so that definitely works and I know there's a few partners the fire service here I don't know whether they want to comment it or not but I think if you were to pull the partnership hub now in Berkeley, would would that would be really good for in Berkeley? Okay, thanks, thanks for that, Paul. I'm just going to bring Ruth in uh, on the partnership hub as well, and maybe Davis is going to have further comment on it. Ruth, through you, convenient just to say that uh, the the email address, the the one stop shop for the email address for elected members is, for instance, it's, you might come across during during your business. It's not instead of other referrals. Um, and nor is it a, not nor is it to bypass the referral process. So it's it's because we're aware of quite often when you're in surgeries or, or, or um, doing your ward business, you'll become across across uh, instances and you'll be emailing council officers. It's hopefully to put a, a sort of streamlining to that process. So it's not it's not to replace the other services that are already in place. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. David. Really, just to 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 build on on, on what Paul has said there, that the the initial stages of setting up a, a hub like this, and when we talk about hotspots or areas of high activity, areas of high demand, um, that's really only the start of the journey. That's the, the the areas that we see activity. The next stage for us, and part of that information sharing process, is to get ahead of that and and to look at using the assets in the communities to see who the groups that elected officials can tie us in with to actually get ahead of that in a positive sense, rather than constantly reacting to where you might have levels of activity. It's not just about well, this has happened and we react to it. It's about trying to get ahead of it. So it's it's great that, that Paul set this up and it's got everyone around the table. But as I say, it has stages and that first stage is, is yes, to get all those referral pathways and all those communication links in place. But the next stage is to look at how do we get ahead of that? How do we go and speak to community groups that can assist us with positive messaging so that we're actually stopping the demand in the first place rather than reacting to it? So it's, it's a really positive group. Yeah, okay, thanks, David. There is a lot of work going into this council uh, uh, behind the scenes and uh, I'm going to push it forward. Uh, and I think we'll probably maybe have maybe, uh, maybe another briefing once everything's up and running and all the well, dotted the I's and cross the T's and stuff. But it is a positive route where you're not chasing various different agencies to get answers. So a lot of it can go through the partnership hub. So we'll see how things progress, but we will keep you posted uh, uh, how things are going on it. Okay, that, Jim? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to Councillor Flaherty, please. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, Paul, can I say it's an extremely positive report, um, but there is one glaring anomaly that um, that I, I thought you you might have picked up on, uh, and it's, it stands out in both your ex, um, executive summary and on the serious organised crime, and that is the decrease in detection rates for drug supply. Now, that links into so many things that you've already talked about, about the drug driving, about the assaults and emergency workers, you know, whether it's NHS staff or own council staff or, or your own staff. And that is probably the most worrying start. Now, I would love it if that 17 drugs, as opposed to a, a, an average of 30, meant that there wasn't a drug supply out there and that you were cleaning up the streets and you know, we've seen a remarkable reduction in the use of drugs. But as elected members have known, and we've had the stats about our drugs rest in Inverclyde, we've had the stats about the use of um, crack cocaine mixed with other substances, uh, and that deep worry there is on the streets of Inverclyde. And, you know, from a, a scrutiny board, that, that is the one thing I would like to hear more from you today. What are we doing to get those detectors, uh, detection rates up um, and that acknowledgement that really um, the problem is still there, if not the problem is actually getting worse in Inverclyde. So it's just in that context on what is a very positive report, but that it's this glaring you know, flashing lights in front of us and that's about the drug detection and serious organised crime. So the drug detection, I can assure you, is absolutely high in my priority. We are still uh, getting warrants, we're still going through people's doors and we're getting drugs uh, pretty much every other week at the moment. So as, there is still a problem in Inverclyde, is, is it increasing? I don't think it is, but 
Um, we, we do have a problem with, with drugs in Inverclyde, absolutely we do. In terms of drug detections, so there is there's a bit of a backlog uh, with our lab uh, at the moment. So when a police officer arrests someone and, and we get whatever well, substance we get, right, and uh, we'll, some of it we'll, we'll be able to do uh, uh, some analysis ourselves, but we'll send it away for analysis. There is a backlog. That crime report will sit as being undetected because we can't confirm that it's a controlled drug at that point. Uh, at some point in the, uh, the line, we'll get the lab report back and it will say, yeah, well, it's cocaine or whatever, and then we'll go back into that in the crime report and we'll change that to, that to a detected crime. So I, I'm very confident that when we start getting the, the lab results coming back to us, that our drug supply detection rate uh, will definitely improve. At the moment, the police officers, whilst we believe that the substance is whatever, whatever that substance is, um, if the individual doesn't admit to it, we send it to the lab. It does take a bit of time for the lab to come back to us on it. Um, obviously, because of COVID, they were hit by COVID as well, and, and that's, that's created a, bit, a wee bit of a backlog here, but they are working their way through it, and I'm very confident our detection rate for that will definitely increase. Um, if I could take all the crimes that were sitting waiting for a lab result, it would look completely different. But my hands are tied because we can't say we've detected a crime for a drug supply if we're not sure what the substance is. So it needs to go for analysis. And, that, and that's, a, that's where we are at the moment with it. Um, well, we can come back in. Yeah. yeah. Paul, great. And I, I accept your, your explanation. You've got to understand from us in a security committee, we're, we're looking at it in this snapshot, you know, and yeah. even that explanation you've given, if you give me that earlier on, I might have known had to ask a question because it is the one glaring anomaly here because yeah. we do think we're, we're in a bit of a crisis here in Inverclyde, you know, we, we do know about our drug deaths, we do understand we're, we're virtually an IRS storm here, but if you're giving me the, the assurance that you are giving us that the detections are, are ongoing and that at some time, we would expect those detections to go back up again to maybe not quite the five-year average, but closer to that, then, then I'm happy with that, Paul. Thanks. Okay, and thanks very much, Jim. Uh, any other questions, members? Okay. Yes, Tommy. Oh, sorry, Jim, how are you? Yeah, um, I've got two, two or three questions. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, it's a very positive uh, report. Uh, it's good to see that overall uh, the trend in, in, in crimes is coming down, which is, a, is certainly good news. Um, three questions I've got is uh, touching on a bit from what uh, Jim and uh, both of both of Jim Jim's have mentioned about detection. Uh, well, sorry, Jim Clockerty mentioned about detection of drugs, but uh, it's not just. Uh, the garden drugs. I think there's some other uh, some other crimes where detection rates are down, and I just wondered if you know there are maybe you know the um, reasons that are known about for that. Is it a lack of evidence, information, is less people coming forward to pass on information, or or, or if there's any other other reasons? Uh, so that's my first question. Uh, my second question would be about Port Glasgow Town Centre. Uh, as we know, there's been some issues, without going into specifics, there's been issues about antisocial, uh, incidents of antisocial behaviour and vandalism. And I just wondered um, if anybody's been uh, caught for, for, for some of the incidents that have happened, uh, and also if CCTV has, has picked up on any of these incidents as well. And lastly, my third question is um, regarding cybercrime. We've been told in the past that a lot of cybercrime comes from other countries, particularly from Eastern Europe. And I just wondered, now that we're all, almost a year out of the uh, the EU, I just wondered um, regarding a relationship with uh, foreign police forces um, and uh, EU intelligence and uh, organisations like Interpol um, has Brexit uh, had a, had a, had any impact on uh, sharing of information? Thank you. 
Hey, thanks very much, Jim. Chief Inspector. Yeah, so, um, so the Port Glasgow Town Centre uh, situation, I'm aware of that, uh, and I'll put extra officers into that area. Um, so our, our intelligence is that, you know, if this is the case, that the youths have, have moved away from Inverkit Beach, so, um, and it would appear that they're now targeting uh, Port Glasgow Town Centre. Um, that's that's and we've modified our uh, youth action plan on a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday night to, to try and address that. So you should you should be seeing more police officers settling the Port Glasgow area. Um, that doesn't mean there's any less in Inverkip Beach because uh, obviously we'll still keep an eye on that. But they seem to have moved from Inverkip Beach uh, up to Port Glasgow for some reason. Um, so uh, absolutely, I'm aware of that. I've got extra officers down there. Uh, I'll keep the presence going, and, and anyone who's caught will be getting. Arrested, team back to mum and dad, Charles, or whatever, uh, parent and the letters will be issued. So I'll, I'll keep on top of that. I am aware that that's a growing concern in that area. So um, uh, I don't know what else to say other than I, I, I will deal with that. Uh, the detection rate, so yeah, the detection rates are down in, in some of our crime types. Um, the only f I suppose the bit what I'd say with that is the detection rates are down, but I've still got a number of live inquiries that are ongoing. So some of these will definitely turn around and they will be detected. Um, it just takes, some some take a bit longer than others. Um, I'm acutely aware of when I need to improve the detection rates. Um, I've got a, a dedicated team getting set up next week to, to look at Group 2 crimes, and, and that's about uh, detection rates as well. And, and then I'll look at other ones. Uh, so I will, we will catch up. We are a wee bit behind with some of this uh, in terms of where we would like to be with detection rates, but it will improve. Absolutely will improve. Uh, and I think you asked something about... Oh, it's yeah. They're trying to Brexit. Yeah, I don't oh. know if Mr Duncan would be maybe best to answer that, because I, I think he would maybe more, have more knowledge of me in that. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So there's been no... Um, diminution of our relationship with law enforcement agencies uh, within the EU or across the globe since Brexit. There are still um, bilateral protocols in place with all these law enforcement agencies and we, we enjoy um, sharing of intelligence appropriately, particularly around cybercrime where we get offenders identified in other jurisdictions and, and that will continue. The difficulty with it is because of um, the nature of cybercrime it tends to be more complex and more difficult to uh, get behind the cyber identities used, and it's more difficult to actually uh, deal with it in certain jurisdictions. But we're on on top of that, and um, regardless of where it emanates from, provide a, a victim-centred response. Make sure that the victims are supported if we identify trends. Try and put out uh, awareness raising of the particular modus operandi that's used. So we try and prevent uh, future victims. And we try and close it down at source, but uh, in, in short, no, there's, there's no um, reduction in the level of service that, that we enjoy from other law enforcement agencies. Yeah, I mean, th thank you. Thank you for uh, responses. O obviously, regarding Port Glasgow, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear if, if there's going to be um, increased activity with police around the town centre because, uh, you know, there are genuine concerns and fears uh, around the town centre. Uh, regarding, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's uh, there's not been any any reduction in um, relationship with uh, uh, with police forces uh, in Europe because, uh, as we all know, the relationship between uh, the EU and the UK has not exactly been too great in in past weeks. So I was just wondering if that had an effect on uh, on any information sharing or gathering between. Uh, Police forces in the UK and uh, in mainland Europe. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, don't see any more questions in the chat, uh, so we'll move on to agenda item number four, which is the spotlight report on 101 call waiting times, which was raised at the last meeting. Uh, and I see Chief Superintendent Duncan's given us a, a briefing report on it, page uh, 21. I have personally had some dialogue with the chair of the SPA on this. It's been raised that 
uh, the national security board convened at meetings as well. Uh, there is concerns there, but we'll, we'll listen to Chief Superintendent Duncan first and then some questions from members. Chief Superintendent. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So I suppose the report kind of speaks for itself. It's got quite a lot of detail around uh, that trend, which uh, has been reported, as you said, that the Scottish Police Authority and in newspapers. Uh, so it was a phenomenon, really. The statistics are provided from the June period, where we saw um, response times for 101, which were non-emergency calls, increase. Uh, but there's also in the paper a number of um, reasons that we uh, in point to for that that increase, and some of those relate to introduction of new systems whereby that first point of contact we might have a longer phone conversation with the member of the public, but actually it improves the level of service that they receive. Uh, and there's also alternative methods by which, if they are delayed on the line for a period of time, there's an online reporting form that they can fill out, etc. Now, I suppose it's important to stress that these are non-emergency calls. Uh, so the 999 system has remained uh, intact through that period with um, the service level agreement to answer calls in under 10 seconds for 999 maintained. In fact, our average is currently sitting at less than 9 seconds. Uh, our, improve, our picture has improved over the last few weeks in terms of the non-emergency calls, the 101 calls, which are actually in the last couple of weeks vying with response times similar to 999. I anticipate that's probably because our uh, staff absence, our occupancy of buildings, the number of people we have on the service desks has increased um, in terms of coming out with the, the COVID restrictions that we saw earlier in the year and our acute levels of absence. And I suppose the other thing to, to point out is that we maintain that level of non-emergency call service throughout the pandemic, which is unique probably to uh, almost unique to the police service, and that's a commitment we gave to service delivery to the public while still maintaining new models such as Thrive, whereby we triage and prioritise calls which the police had to attend again during the pandemic. So it's a, a responsibility that we had to our staff, officers attending calls in the street, and also the public in terms of trying to contain infection rates within our communities. I suppose that the report, as I've said, despite the fact I've just uh, rehearsed it uh, verbally, it does speak for itself and gives a lot of detail, which I hope you find useful. But again, I'm happy to take any questions. Councillor McElhenney. Thank you, Chair. Um, I yeah, thanks, Convener. Uh, before I get into my question, first of all, uh, Chief Inspector, thanks for, for the report. It does give a... Uh, uh, an explanation for, for some of the, the potential reasons that, that members of the public are held up on calls. But before I get to my question, prior to, to, to COVID, I, I, I'll keep this generic as best I can. Prior to, to COVID, I remember uh, driving uh, past a, a building site uh, and I noticed uh, a number of individuals, not, not kids or children, adults, I thought, uh, removing parcel uh, part of that a Harris fencing to, to access the, the, the site. Now, I, I phoned the 101 from my hands-free uh, in, in my car, and from the start of the phone, I was, when I passed the, the building site, I was heading to a, a Tenants and Residents Association meeting, so I would say it's maybe between five and ten minute drive, and I had parked the car at the, the venue, and I, I ended up hanging up. So that's, I would say, seven minutes uh, I, w I was waiting, uh, the call not getting answered. I went into the, I sat beside the, the community police and I informed the community police and they said, oh, it's okay, we'll, we'll call it in. Um, I had that luxury because they were there, but it's an example uh, of me, the, the bad experience that I had. Regarding the, 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 the report, if I, if I take you to 2.3 uh, of the report on page 21, um, it says here that between 60 and 120 seconds in automated message. Is that a, a, a varying messages? That's why there's, there's a 60 to 120 seconds. I'd have thought it would have been the same standard standard message on that particular uh, paragraph. Regarding paragraph uh, 2.4, uh, when we talk about the calls maybe longer because 
it's because of COVID. You've got to ascertain what um, if anybody in the household ha has COVID or any symptom, etc. I thought that it would have been just a, a generic uh, response, particularly if, if officers are going to make a, a, a house call, then they would, as an example, turn up at the door and, and they could ask three questions at the door uh, if it's possible or indeed if they're getting in, they'll wear a face mask. I don't see why that injury needs to be gleaned over the phone. Uh, that can be done at a later time. Over the page, regarding the the, the satisfaction, uh, paragraph 2.7, yeah, they're all highly uh, credible responses and it puts the, the service in, in, a, in a good light. But where's the where's the, the satisfaction level of people who, who get fed up hanging on the, on the line and, and hung up? That doesn't get reflected in the report. If you look at the, the Police Scotland website um, regarding the, the 101 calls, uh, what should be one, 101 be used for? You should call 101 if you want to talk to your local police officer. Is that, the, is that indeed the case? That I could phone I want to speak to a, a, an Inver Clyde or a, a, a good green-up policeman uh, or, or woman. Um, get crime prevention advice or report a crime that does not need an emergency response. For example... If your car has been stolen, well, excuse me, if my car's been stolen, then it's not a, it's not a 101 call. That's a treble nine call because who knows what that car's been getting going to be getting used for. So I have to say, maybe this the example needs to be looked at again. The next bullet, your property has been damaged. What does that mean? If I'm away from the back and I see my front door has been kicked in and there's been a break-in. Does that mean that it's a 101 call? Because my property has been damaged. It's been an actual break-in. So it's a bit woolly, that particular, particular sentence. Uh, I think our, our, these comments reflect on the, the constituents that have approached me to say 101 is not fit for purpose and the, the length of time people have to wait to, to speak to, to someone is just not, not good enough. Okay, okay. thanks, Councillor Ackley. Uh... David, would you like to, to respond? Yeah, no, no, thanks. Thanks for those questions. And first of all, I do appreciate the frustration that people do experience if they don't get uh, a of whilst they're, they're on that line. Um, as I've said, it is a non-emergency number, and I, I take your points in terms of interpretation of what an emergency is. There's other guidance that, that is there, and we also produce a, a report each year about um, use of the 99 call system, which, again, um, sometimes isn't as we would expect or, or hope. Um, in terms of your specific points, so um, waiting for uh, between 60 and 120 seconds, that depends on the cycling of the calls and the prioritisation of them, whether they're answered between 60 or, or, or 120 seconds. So during that period, if there's no answer, then that automated message will kick in, but that, that's a technical system. If you need further information on that, we can, we can find out more, but it's, it's a technical solution. Um, in terms of the health and safety requirement, we took a lot of guidance around health and safety for officers, staff and uh, members of the public during the planning of our operational response. So the most appropriate uh, time to ask those questions is prior to any contact between officers and members of the public. So that's why that response was put in place. Um, the survey, so that the survey is, is conducted in terms of user satisfaction and also in general terms, we, we have a, a general public confidence survey so the figures that are provided there are people that have actually used the service so that's people that have contacted uh, Scotland and have provided those responses so it is actually service users but I do take your point in terms of people that weren't satisfied will be probably in those categories uh, that don't uh, fall into those percentages so the the four percent the 38 percent that would go contrary to those stats and again the chief constable has said uh, publicly that it's a matter of regret that uh, certain members of the public have to wait for longer than our target time, but, but that, that is the nature of uh, the pandemic and the changes that have been made to the system and, and adapting to that system. But we're constantly trying to improve that, and as I've said, over recent weeks we have seen higher levels of compliance with the system, and that is now, as you'd expect, a matter of regular review and a focus for our executive and that service. I don't know if that does that cover all the questions or have I missed anything. Okay, thanks, Jan. Uh, we'll move on to Councillor Yeah, yeah, thanks, Convener. Very quick quickly, what this does they tell us 
is the amount of drop calls. The amount of drop calls would have a clear indication of how well the service is doing. And because that stat must be available to them. So you would expect that we'd be able to see the drop calls after five minutes, after 10 minutes, after 15 minutes, after 20, so and so on. So I think it's a drop call start that would give us the real information of how well 101 was doing. Um, it, the stats themselves are okay, but they're not fantastic. I mean, it, it's almost a third of, of respondents felt that police were not easy to contact. So if that was given as a start, well, that's not that good. Um, so it's re really just a, a wee query, uh, Paul, on the drop calls and whether there's information on them drop calls. Keith Rubin, would you like to respond? Yep, yep. Uh, so uh, this uh, briefing paper is obviously produced at the national level and based on statistics that um, our, our division, our command and control division, have available. I'd have to double check in terms of what exactly they, they collate, whether a, a drop call does show up in the system. I think a lot of these are where um, time target is breached and then retrieved statistics from that, but we can find out if there's any further detail available on that. Um, in terms of user satisfaction, I'm not familiar with uh, police uh, user satisfaction surveys. That those are actually quite high levels of satisfaction compared with um, other surveys. Uh, so in the circumstances, I, I would personal view would be that they are quite remarkably high given what we read uh, in, in some of the coverage of the 101 service. But again, uh, as as the chief has said, and I'll reiterate, uh, you know we do regret whenever we don't manage to meet that that level of service, and we're constantly trying to find ways to improve. And there is a, an improvement mechanism put in place with C three that, that we're currently on. But, but your points are well made. Thanks, David. Okay, thanks. I'm okay. Thanks, I'm fine. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, it was really useful to actually see this report uh, today. So thanks for bringing it along. It gives us an understanding about not not just where we're at with the calls, but you know the tough times that we've all been through. You know, and in, in, in terms of COVID, uh, so it, it kind of gives you the you know the reasons why maybe the this the service probably because it's new, and then we've got COVID on top of that. So thanks a lot for for bringing it along. It's been really useful. So. Can I just ask, is there plans for um, some of these stats and the, the ongoing information to be included in the main body of the sort of police reports? I think it would be useful for us as a scrutiny committee to see those kind of stats on a on a regular basis, especially once we get into non-COVID times, if that ever happens, mm -hmm. uh, when things kind of settle down. I think it would be useful uh, to see that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. I, I think the, the Scottish Police Authority will ret retain a bit of an interest in this, so I'd expect that statistics will be available, but again, it'll be at, at national level, because the nature of that national division. We, we will find out, we'll take an action to find out what level of statistical information might be available forward. I know there is, there is um, an interest in making sure it's to improve the possible. Okay, thanks. Okay, then. Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, as I said earlier, I've had a, a bit of input into this with, with the SPA, and, and my, my personal opinion, uh, I think there is an issue with 101. Uh, I absolutely accept that COVID has played its part, but uh, my understanding is that when COP26 was on, there was no leave for, for anybody in, in the, the 101 call answering, call answering service, uh, and the, the, the response times were significantly better. Now, I accept, David uh, and Paul, that you don't have an input in, into the, the C3 organisation as such, it's, it's helpless to be with, but I really would appreciate it if you convey members' concerns uh, to the relevant individuals, whoever that may be, that the, the, the one we, in Inverclyde, we, we think the one one is an issue, and we look forward to, to, to further dialogue uh, and prior to myself or to the committee in general uh, to see things improve, and it, it would be useful, I think, uh, get some statistics on, on the drop calls and on how things uh, improve or otherwise. Uh, maybe not every, every meeting, maybe once every uh, three or four meetings or once a year even, uh, just so, so members can have a, 
have a look at that and see where we are with it. But uh, th- thanks for your input today, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see how things progress. Is there any other questions before we move on? Yes, please, Tommy. Sorry, to, sorry. To... Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like one said, uh, it's been very good having this report because um, you know there has been issues, and I've had some constituents uh, raise the. Uh, the issue of some difficulty they've had getting through to uh, the 101 number as as well. Um, I can understand the, the, the difficulties, but particularly over the pandemic uh, and the obviously you know the issues there. It's uh, been for all of us. Um, I just I just wondered um, as 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 the convener just said there, the you know leave was cancelled during COP26. And there seem to be improvements, so uh, that might lend us to believe that the, the, there was more people handling calls during that time. Uh, so, is, could there well be uh, an issue that there aren't enough call handlers? Uh, is this being looked at? Is it being reviewed at all um, uh, nationally? Uh, and my other question is: I'm reading through the report. I can't actually. Forgive me if I, if I haven't seen it, but what, what is the average time for a uh, for a response from a call handler when somebody makes a one-on-one call? And what was what was the average time before the pandemic and uh, and and uh, with increased demand during the pandemic? David. Yeah, so as I've mentioned, that there is interest from the Scottish Police Authority. It's been uh, discussed at that uh, forum uh, quite publicly. So, so the, there is an ongoing review of processes applied and striving for improvement in, in service. So uh, paragraph 3.1, you'll see that in, in the paper. In terms of specific times, uh, I have that to hand. We can certainly try and uh, get that detail. Okay, Thank Jim. You. Okay, Jim. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay, no other questions. So we'll move on to the last item on the agenda, uh, which is the update report. And I think it's you. Thanks very much, Kimber. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is just a report on the aware making you aware of any national initiatives that you consultants that are appropriate to inform members of the agenda the survival. 2.3 gives you a list of consultancies that have already been carried out, and within your papers, there are passionate to show you. Bring your attention to some parts of the report as it goes through 6.32, uh, with a, a lot of discussions on the 101, and within 6.3, as uh, the computer is mentioned, that will be uh, to the board and has now had a response in the time that we've been with the convener. Uh, that sounds not good. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Jim, you're very, very faint. Can you hear me? I've got, a problem with my, I've got a problem with my computer at the moment, so I'll try something to see if I can get the volume up. You, you, you're up better now. That sounds up better now. Maybe you're a bit closer to the mic. Okay. Sorry about that. Start again then? Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, the paper gives you an update on any national initiatives, reviews, consultants that's been carried out with a profit to the, to the committee. To inform members of potential uh, agenda items for police and fire uh, and rescue matters. 2.3 gives you a list of consultancies that have already been carried out, and find your papers are the attachments of the, the papers that's been submitted on your behalf and that also agreed with the committee. Within the paper, I'll, I'll not go through the whole paper, but I'll just bring you to some uh, key issues on it. Uh, within uh, 6.1 is a breakdown of what was discussed at the Scottish uh, Authority Board on the 29th of September. 6.3, as we mentioned already, within the report uh, and discussion of uh, 101 calls. Uh, 6.3 is just confirmation, as the has said previously, that uh, he'd made uh, a written confirmation to the chair about concerns around 101. And we're still working uh, with the convener on that to get more feedback in the future. 7 gives you an update of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Boards uh, and also on the an update of what the discussions were at their meeting on the 26th of August 2020. I'd like to bring your attention to 5.7 of the report. 
uh, again, the convener um, has written to the, the Minister for Community Safety regarding uh, the new systems around smoke alarms in the house. I'm already uh, raising concerns about where the, the read financial barrier and required to your lands be fitted financially to most vulnerable families uh, and the community to the transfer more additional resources to be allocated to that uh, to work with the convener. That's good again. I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry. I've read the report. Okay, thanks, you. Uh, I thank the call for that. Uh, any questions? Council Nelson? Yeah, it's been touched on again about the, the one on one calls. I wondered if, if if a system could be set up whereby um, if a call wasn't answered within a certain time, then the the person who's calling in could have the opportunity to leave a message and be called back again. Is, is that something that could be considered in the future? David, second. Yeah, it's Paul, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. The automated message provides the alternative means of, of contact. Um, we don't, as far as I understand it, keep a answering uh, machine for people to, to leave messages. That would create other demands and require us to troll through voicemail. So it's dealt with through that automated message system. It people to uh, other uh, reporting facilities such as the, the contacts or online reports ensure that it gets recorded. Thanks, David. Uh, okay, thanks, David. Uh, that's maybe one I can take away with the SPA, but uh, it's, uh, I understand there is maybe operational issues, how, how, they, how they call back through call and such, but I, I can take that one away. Uh, Councillor Moran, I think, is next. Hi, thanks, Kavina. It's obviously like 7.5 since I brought up at the last meeting regarding the, the installation of the alarm systems, which is going to be a law come February. Now, we didn't get a response from the Minister, which I read, and, and she said, well, I, I had already said the allocation is something like 500,000, which is going nowhere near what we will need to, to install these alarms. Also, it was about it again about the police and fire, uh, the fire rescue, who will be con Captain vulnerable people. Now, is there any way we know how they would get referred to the, the fire rescue? Are they, do they have a list at the moment, or will they be waiting for social work, example, to give them a list of the vulnerable people? And of course, uh, will we be running a, a wider publicity campaign on this after the new year to inform people exactly what the, the rules are regarding? Uh, these installations and these fire system alarm systems. Uh, thank, thanks very much for that. I think on the vulnerable people, there, there, there was already something in place which we put in maybe a year and a half ago where we chained up some of our HSE team, the home carers team, and uh, they are already doing that, uh, notifying the SFRS of uh, vulnerable people with regard to smoke alarms, etc. etc. So that is, that is ongoing. Uh, I, I don't know if it's been spread out to the, the other care providers, but that's ongoing from a, a council point of view. On the publicity, uh, I, I did try and contact George Barber. I haven't heard back from George. I, I don't know, Ruth, if you have any, any further information there. Yeah, maybe we'll take that if that's okay. Yeah, okay, Hugh. Yeah, yeah, we are going to be doing some uh, communications uh, with uh, George around community safety elements, and that's on the agenda. There's a meeting of community safety partnership next week that's on the agenda, so that will be going out. We're also making sure that we speak to our, our colleagues from uh, FIRE just so that they will get the relevant information. Probably a joint statement from out. Okay, thanks, you. There, there is a there is a leaflet which here on the pair have also provided as well, uh, which I imagine will be part of the publicity campaign. Uh, moving forward, so uh, I'm assuming you've got that, Hugh? Yeah, we've got that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Robert, anything you want to come back on? No, oh, Kavina, I'm glad that uh, we're, we're, we're going to get the uh, right publicity. You know what I brought up because I was I sat in the Scottish Older People's Assembly and it, this was brought to my attention and they asked me to bring it to my local authority as every other member of the committee was to do so. I'm really glad that uh, I have brought attention and it seemed to be uh, for moving the right direction. So. I, I'm really happy with the, the, the action that we're proposed to take. Yeah. Okay, Robert. Thanks for your comments. I'm going to bring in David McCarry. David. 
Thanks, convener. Thanks, councillor. It's a, re a really good point. Um, I suppose it's the million dollar question. The, the people that we most want to reach in, in, in our communities is the thing that we've been striving to do for for some significant time now. And, and obviously there is a cost associated with it. It's come back in, on the back of the Grenfell Action Plan. So for those most vulnerable uh, that, that reach that criteria, we will fit that system free of charge. We have also pointed people towards Scottish Government website, frequently asked questions for reduced cost systems. We also, in conjunction with the local authorities, I have to say, fund the care and repair team that works across certainly the three local authorities that, that, that we cover to look at those who might not fit that criteria, but might just sit just below it of a fashion. But if the referral pathways that we did in the back of the fatal fire action plan a number of years ago, as you, as you recall, in Inverclyde, when we trained over 400 home care staff to look at those signs and symptoms of somebody that might be vulnerable to, to fire, layer that on top of the partnership hub that, that Paul and colleagues in Police uh, Scotland have had a lot of energy behind. That's the, the mechanisms for us to really find out who most needs our help. You just need to look at our report to see 94% um, success rate in interlinked alarms, 100% success rate in detection, zero fire casualties. So the links are all there, but if people are presented to us and the referral pathways are, are brought to us, that's where we will deploy. We will go out and, and, and be in no doubt, regardless of the circumstances, we will not leave somebody without a working smoke detection system in their house. But it's that criteria that we deploy from a fire and rescue service. And for everyone else, we'll make sure they get the right information uh, and reductions in cost of the system is where it's appropriate. But it's a really good point, convener. Yeah. OK, yeah, thanks very much for that information. Most helpful. Uh, can I call the Councillor Macalini, please? Thanks, convener. I'm sorry, but going back to the 101 uh, call system again, I wonder if it would be appropriate for Chief Inspector to give us a brief, or quite indeed, I'm happy to for to get provided a, a, a written brief for by email further on if it's not available at the moment, is to give us an understanding of the actual call centre um, handlers, how, how the, the process works. Do we have two dedicated teams, one for treble nine calls and one for 101 calls? How do, how do they pick up the calls? For example, are they sitting waiting the first call? In a queue, first person available to picks up a call, whether it be nine, treble nine or 101, or is there a possibility that everybody's tied up with 101 calls and there's nobody to answer treble nine? How does the, the process work? <laughs> Uh, David, I don't, I don't know if you want to take that now or you want to take that away and maybe give us a further update at the next meeting. What's your thoughts? Yeah, it was probably a bit in depth for, for this meeting. We can take that off table, but there is a system, as you'd expect. Happy to give you another. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That gentleman, yeah, further update at the next meeting. There's, a, there's also a thing for partners. Uh, it's called a journey of a call, uh, which we do as well. So maybe we could do that for you um, and just talk you through that a journey with it. Either the one or a table nine call comes in. There is a there is a thing that the C three does. It's called journey of a call, so we could look at that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, gentlemen. I, I do appreciate it. Do we have any other questions, Jim McLeod? Colin. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, about the fire and the smoke alarms. I think it's um, certainly it would be very good for people to to get to know a, a you know a list of. Uh, bona fide traders who can um, who can install these for people. Um I think that's really important. I don't want to see anybody being ripped off. Um so I think that's uh, that's a really important uh, thing. Um regarding the, the various initiatives and the tasers, I, I mean I, I know this this is a, a national report but I just wondered if in Inverclyde we have any sort of information about how many uh, tasers are issued uh, and regarding uh, any use of tasers in the district, how many incidents has been there. I appreciate maybe that's maybe information that could be sent out later on. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Paul or David, would you like to take that? Yeah, I'll take an action to I, I, I don't think it's appropriate to put it over the public forum, so I'll take an action and I'll tell you how many tasers we've got and how many tasers have been deployed or, or actually uh, uh, point with the red dotted or whatever. So I, I'll have a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's Yes, um, uh, uh, that's why I said it might be 
better just to be sent it afterwards. OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. OK, and I'm going to bring in Machine. Do you have a comment, Machine? Uh, yes, through you, convener. So obviously, it is a grave concern to us um, in terms of the kind of the the bogus um, workman um, implications of the the linked fire alarm systems, and obviously they are already kind of fairly high cost items. I, I would doubt that you could have one fitted, even in a smaller property, for anything under one hundred and fifty pounds. I think it's something that we are certainly discussing regularly with the community action team and Alan Barnes and the fire service to see how we would um, target the message round about it. Um, I think, you know, to give a bit of perspective, obviously anyone who lives within an RSL property or a rented property will, it's the responsibility of the, the landlord to effectively ensure that that is, that the correct fire systems are installed. So it's not going to affect all of our Inverclyde residents, but it will undoubtedly um, have an impact on a number. Um, I know that it's not cheap, but I think from what David has said, the the price to save lives isn't really that much and providing the referral mechanisms are correct and we can actually get the most vulnerable um, through and with the assistance of the fire service to actually have these alarms fitted. And if we can have a look through the trusted trader scheme about, you know, suitable um, fitters, um, it's something that we are very keen to do uh, from the trading standards side of things. And if I can go off at a, a very <laughs> sharp tangent, um, with regard to illegal money lending activities, the offence is under the Consumer Credit Act, so effectively it sits within trading standards powers as having primacy over the enforcement. It is incredibly difficult to actually deal with. We obviously have a dedicated uh, Scottish Illegal Money Lending Unit, which is funded by UK government. And my apologies, I haven't sent on the information requested um, in relation to it. I wanted to make sure that I had the most updated information for you, and I will forward it on um, with details of there's a new website and there are a number of ways where people can report it. But it's, it's a very niche um, activity. It's down to um, almost wording of legislation. So the offences are around about someone who doesn't actually have a credit license. It doesn't matter whether or not you are licensed and charging 1500% APR. They're not committing offences, but it doesn't make it any more palatable than those who are unlicensed and perhaps charging 50% APR. So it's incredibly difficult. It affects people's lives very, very badly. But I think it's one of these ones where we can put the information out there, we can try and support people as much as possible, but it is, it's been part of um, communities for a million years, unfortunately, and it's not going to be easily fixed. So apologies for going back to that, but I thought it was important to kind of lay out whose responsibility it was, what the legislation was, and what we can actually do about it. But I will send you on all the information. Okay, thanks for the machine. Thanks for that, Sal. I'm sure Councillor Jackson, you, you, you will lay it offline. Uh, do we have any further questions? Um, Tommy, Tommy, can I just suggest then, um, just on the back about machines, just said there that uh, maybe the meeting we have with the councillor might yep. would be at that as well. I don't know how the council feels about that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy with that. No, the, the, the more the better. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll arrange that then. Okay, okay. thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's the meeting now closed. Thanks everybody for coming along. Thanks for your contribution as always. Thank you. Thank you, Kim Vino.